tears and laughter, she said, you do realize that you shaved the share the pulpit with Brother Will and Brother Timmy and all that stuff. And, and uh, like I told this morning, I feel like they're way more qualified for it than I am. So, uh, but thank you so much. Thank you for the platform. I know I say, I feel like I say this every time, but I mean it. Thank you so much for the opportunity for our family to serve your students. Um, we love them to death. Um, they're a great bunch of kids, and we appreciate that opportunity very much. Um, before we get started, before I kick off and dive in this morning, let's go ahead and open up in prayer. Dear God, thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you so much for this church and this church family and everything that they mean to our family. I just pray that um, this morning I step out of the way and what you need said gets said, God, and that... Um, if there's somebody here that doesn't know who you are this morning, that today be the day that they find you. It's in your name I pray. Amen. So I'm going to kick off with a story. Um, it was Eastern Airlines Flight 401. This was December 29th, 1972. It's known as um, one of the worst days in Florida aviation history. Um, and what had happened was... Um, they were circling Miami International Airport. They were coming from New York to Miami, and they lowered the landing gear, and the light in the switch didn't come on that acknowledged that the landing gear in the front had come down and locked into place. So the pilots made the decision. They were going to go down underneath the, the uh, cabin, check everything out, troubleshoot it, make sure that everything was okay before they made their landing. Um, sometimes they do a flyby with air traffic controller um, to check and see if it was down. But this time they had decided, we're going to check it. We're still far enough out. We've got time. So as the pilot is preparing to go down to check this, he sets the plane into autopilot. But what he did not realize is as he set the plane in autopilot, he gently tilted it forward which set the plane in gradual descent. So gradual that nobody noticed they were descending, not even the flight crew, the passengers, anything like that. So the pilot gets down, and he goes, and he's checking this out, and it ends up that the landing gear was, in fact, locked, that a $12 light in the top of the switch had gone out. But as he's down there figuring that out, the low altimeter alarm starts to go off in the pilot's chair. This is not a loud alarm. It's just a gentle buzz to let him know, hey, you're checking it, you're approaching, they're close to where they're going to land and everything. And the plane slowly gets to the point that when they realize how close they are to the ground, they can't recover. And I say all that to say, that most of the time, our lives are a lot the same. It's a slow fade. There's a song in there somewhere. Um, we've just made it through the holiday season. Um, time is usually filled with recollection of the things that we wanted to do, the things that we wanted to accomplish, where we went wrong, um, how we're going to get there next year. And we call this our New Year's resolution. In my case, most of the time, it's our New Year's fail because I'll make it for a little while and then slowly but surely, life starts creeping back in and it tends to take control back over our time, to take control back over the things that we have going until at the end of the year, we're sitting there again wondering where we went wrong and what we can do to make it better next time. All too often, this is the same in our Christian lives. We, fall, we get saved. We go to camp. We go to a retreat. We read a really, really um, powerful book that just kind of changes the way we think, that changes the way that we respond, changes the way that we look at things. And we come out and we're on fire for God. Um, and we want to spread the good news to everybody. We want to tell the story and, and we want to share um, 
salvation and God with everybody. And we get excited when someone wants to respond back. When we're, we're talking about, hey, something's different with you. Yeah, let me tell you about what God's done for me. That, that moment where it's, it's all coming together, you're on fire, you want to tell, you want to see the kingdom of God extended. And we slowly lose our zeal and passion that we once had. Only to look back at the smoke-filled ambers that are left from where we were. Sitting there wondering, wondering, when was the last time I shared my faith? When was the last time I studied the Bible? When was the last time I talked to God? This is when we as Christians start to sit back and build our Christian checklist. Where we sit back and we say, okay, I'm going to do better at this. I'm, I'm going to grow. I want to do this. So I'm going to read 72 chapters of the Bible in the next three months. To do this, I have to read so much uh, every night. Or I'm going to read this book in the next, the next three weeks. I'm going to pray this long, elegant prayer. I'm going to have this quiet time at the exact moment every day. We start, this is what I'm going to do to get better. This is the direction that I'm going in to, to get to where I want to be. And I'm standing up here today, and I want to, to say this. Two verses of quality reading is better than 20 chapters of skimming through. And what do I mean by that? There's times that I sit down and I read a little bit and I'm like, what does that word mean? Where does that come from? And I dive in deeper and deeper and I may only read a sentence. I may only read a verse. And then there's times where I'm doing it to check it off my list and I read through a chapter and I can walk away and Katie or one of the kids can say, what would you just read? And I'm like, I have no idea. But I did it. I did it to check it off my list. And that's the trap that we fall in. And I am the world's worst about sitting there and I'm going to pray this and I want to voice all this other kind of stuff and then next thing I know, I'm thinking about hunting, I'm thinking about fishing, I'm thinking about what the stuff that I got to do. And I'm like, no, 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 I got to pray. So I, I get back to it, and then my brain starts to race again. But the good thing is that we're not alone. If we wander off into deep sleep while we're praying, if you don't stay... Um, I wander off into deep space while I'm praying, and I don't stay on task also. But in this, I want you guys to know and to feel God still loves us so much. The title for the sermon today was So Loved. How do we know that God loved us so much? If we jump into John 3.16 this morning, it says, For God so loved the world. And when we dive into that, and you sit there and you look at it, it doesn't say that God loved the world. It said he so loved the world. You know, and, and I get that, like when you scoop one of your kids up and you grab them and you hug them, you're like, I love you so much. Not just a, hey man, I love you. But that embrace, that warm feeling, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life you're not just loved but you're so loved he loved you so much that's how the God of the universe the God of creation feels about each and every one of us and he loves us all equally. The same God that died for me also died for everyone else in this world equally. And he so loved everyone else 
in this world. 1 John 4 verses 8 through 12 um, tells us that anyone who does not love does not know God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. In, in this, the love of God is made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that he might live through him. Verse 10, in this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that, we have, that he loved us and sent his son to be the uh, propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us. And his love is perfected in us. So God loves us so much that he sent his only son that I could have an eternal relationship with him. I don't know about you guys, but I sit back and I think about that, especially now that I have kids of my own. And I think about sending one of my kids for everybody. That's tough. Sending my only kid for everybody, that is, that is love. That is nothing but a perfect picture of love. Sending my kid so that you and I could have an eternal relationship. Sending my kid to pay your debt. I don't know that I would be as willing and as able to do it as God did. That's why God is a God of love. We have to understand this to be able to understand God's calling on our life. Verse 11 says, since God loved, then show, so shall we. This is also important for us to realize because we're called to be imitators of God. Ephesians 5.1 tells us, therefore, be imit imitators of God as beloved children. Have you ever thought that statement completely through be an imitator of God you may be the only image of God that somebody sees in their life you may be the only reflection of God somebody is awarded of seeing in their life from being in the right place at the right time and me and this mic is going to fight again So if God so loved and I am called to follow him in my daily ministry, then I too should portray love. Sorry. This is where the checklist Christianity becomes so dangerous. Where we sum up our Christian life by how many chapters we read, by the elegant prayer we prayed, the Christian books we've read, we tend to develop a more quantity over quality attitude for our Christianity. It's great to learn. It's great to study and grow closer to God. But as we're about to see, without love, none of this means anything. You know, there's, there's lessons that I think back of, and one of the first things I remember as a youth in youth group was our youth pastor diving into 1 Corinthians 13 with us and us studying that as a group and walking through it as a group. And I remember one of the first things, and it stuck out so firmly in our mind, was he made that point where God is love, we're called to be imitators, but then he started reading 1 Corinthians 13, and he said, Hey, if we're called to be love, then if we took that Bible verse and we took love out, starting in verse 4, and we put our name in there, would it fit? Would you be that person? And I got to thinking about it, and um, if you ask Katie... 
some of these things I, I struggle with every day. And uh, the, the first one gets me every time. And verse 4, it says that love is patient. And I, that, is, that is one of my, my uh, not very much winning things in my life. I, I do maintenance for a living. Um, you guys know that I'm an electrician. So when you get called, you go in, you get it done, you get it done fast so that everything gets back up to running. And then that filters over into your own life. Um, we, were, we were actually in the hospital with Sawyer and he was at pediatric ICU in Huntsville, and he was having some respiratory issues. He was a little bitty baby, and me being the get it done now guy that I am, I, the nurse come in there, and they're like, well, we still don't know exactly what's going on. We're going to start this. We're going to try this, and we're just going to see how it goes and let it play its course, and I kind of, in my um, not-so-happy dad moment, said, what do we got to do to make this go away? Like, we're just going to keep trying stuff? When are we going to figure out what's going on? And she just turned and looked at me, and she said, and this is a God teaching moment because it's one of those moments that God grabbed me up and, and made me realize how I, how I bull rushed into everything in the life. She said, you do maintenance for a living, don't you? And I was like, yes, ma'am. And she said, this is not a machine. This is a complex built by God organism that sometimes we don't understand how to fix. And I, I sit back for a minute and I was like, I don't like that answer. But the more I thought about it, she's right. You know, she, she's exactly right. Not everything in life can be rushed into. And patience is my, my one that usually gets me. Katie reminds me all the time to be patient. So I'm going to jump in this morning and read 1 Corinthians 13. But I want you to look at how it paints an awesome picture of what God's love looks like as well as what we should be growing towards. As we read this, you can take the word love out starting in verse 4 and replace it with your name. 1 Corinthians 13 1. If I speak in tongues of men and angels, but have not love. I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. <laughs> you know, in Clint Perry terms, my paraphrase right here, if what you're doing is not out of love, you're wasting your time. You're nothing more than a squeaky wheel. And you look at it, and it, it's right there. If I speak in tongues of men and angels, but have not love... I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic, <laughs> prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and I have all the faith so as to move the mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have and I deliver up my body to be burned, but have no love, I gain nothing. Why is that? Because we're called to be imitators of a loving God. And here in verse 4 is where you can start putting your name in there. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own ways. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the, the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up my childish ways. For 
now we see in a mirror dimly, but, we, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have fully known. And then verse 13, so now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. I think about that in verse 12 this morning as I was checking myself in the mirror to make sure that the outside, that the outward was perfect, that it, that it not perfect because you're not going to make this perfect. That's a bad choice of words. Um, but presentable, I guess, is a better way to put that. And I got to thinking about that. What does it really matter about the outside if we're standing up here for serving this church and we're not doing it with love if we're serving this community and we're not doing it with love if we're we're serving our specific groups i know many of you um are teachers are involved in all the different ministries and the teams that go in on on this church and if we're doing those things just out of obligation just because we feel like we need to just because we're checking off something off the list and we're not loving on the people around us while we're doing it. Are we really making an impact? Or are we making an impact that we would follow ourselves? C.S. Lewis is quoted in response to 1 Corinthians 13, 7. It never proclaims the errors of others. It refuses to see faults in others unless it may kindly help in their removal. It stands in the presence of a fault with a finger on its lips. It's not quick to jump up and judge others. So my challenge as we kick off this new year is to examine what we're really showing the world or examine if we're really showing the world love or not. Love is the foundation of our faith after accepting Christ. So this year, instead of falling back in the slow fade, jumping the steering, or bumping, not jumping, don't jump the steering wheel, bumping the steering wheel and not realizing you're in a gradual descent, let's focus on what we do out of love. What you should never, what you do should never be out of obligation. Our faith should not be based on some checklist of things we feel like we need to get done, but on the things we can do out of love. These are the things that will last. So I'm going to ask Timmy if he'll come up here and um, lead us in a song, but I want to say, as they're coming up and getting ready, if you're sitting here this morning and, and you don't know who Christ is, you've never made that, that call to accept Christ's loves in, into your life, please make today be that day. Don't, don't go on checking a checklist. If you're sitting in church, you, you prayed, you, you read your Bible, and as you go on, because those things aren't the things that last, and those aren't the things that, that carry us into the future. And if you're sitting here this morning and, and kicking off the new year like me and taking a look back at, you know, maybe being patient, maybe being kind, or maybe doing things that are worthwhile, that are everything we do should be worthwhile, but doing things out of love. Um, and you just need to leave that at the throne this morning. The altar will be open. Dear God, thank you so much for the opportunity to, to share with the church family this morning. Thank you for um, everyone that's represented here and the platform that they have given me this morning, God. And I just pray that if anybody's in here and they don't know who you are, that today would be the day that they, they turn that over to you. And if there's needs and, and things that need to be discussed with you here this morning, that those are laid out, God. And I just pray that you watch over us and protect us and let us grow closer to you. In your name I pray. Amen. Let's stand together.
heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath. In our lives, so we pour out our praise to you only. You give life, you are love, you bring light to the dark. call your attention to a few things uh, before we pray together at the end of our service. Thank you, Clint, for that message, by the way. I, I, told, I, I mentioned the bulletin earlier, and hopefully you did get one of those on your way in. There's a lot of events in there. I don't have time to go over them all today, but I encourage you to check out uh, the, or, the upcoming events in your bulletin, or you can also access that in our church app in the newsletter or in the worship guide, which is in that church app as well. 
So I encourage you to take the time to look over that. But a couple of things I wanted to highlight. First uh, pertains to today. We have no evening activities tonight, but we will at the cl conclusion of this service. Unfortunately, we will be taking down our Christmas decorations. So if you are able at the end of this service today, please stay and help us take down the trees and take down one of the wreaths took itself down earlier this morning. So we took the other one down as well. But if you would just help us pack all that up and put it away until next year which is only 51 Sundays away. Well, it's less than that because it's the first Sunday of Advent four weeks ahead. Sorry, my math's not that fast. Uh, we will resu resume our normal schedule, though, beginning this week. Wednesday night, we'll have our normal activities beginning at 6 p.m., and then next Sunday will be normal Sunday morning and then normal Sunday evening, uh, we'll, which means our Awana clubs resume at 5.30 next Sunday night. Our youth worship resumes at 5.30 next Sunday night. And then we will begin a new adult Bible study at 5.30 p.m. next Sunday night. That Bible study will meet in the AEB, which is to my left, your right. Uh, you can uh, be in there at 5.30 for that study. And that is, I believe they're going to be going through the, uh, the whole Bible, if I'm not mistaken. Not in one week, of course, but Will's going to be walking you through the Bible and that, that's for those that are not involved in our Awana clubs or in our youth worship services. Uh, I also want to point out to you, hopefully you've made some New Year's resolutions, and hopefully on the 5th of January those resolutions are still intact. Um, but it's not too late to add to those resolutions if you've not already done, uh, done this one. Uh, Last year, we began a program called Woodward in the Word, where we were just very simply encouraging our people to read God's Word together. And this year, we're continuing that program, and you've got the whole year's readings ready to go today. You can know what you're going to read on Christmas Day of 2020, right now. It's all right here. But there are two lists. I want to make sure you know that. The first list, which is in my left hand, uh, is, is kind of uh, continuing in the pattern that we did last year, where we're reading one book at a time, beginning with Matthew. And it just so happens that that reading begins tomorrow. So you can join us tomorrow in the book of Matthew by picking up one of these lists. But there's also a second list where we are encouraging you to go through the book of Psalms in 2020, as well as the book of Proverbs. You'll notice this list ends in November. The year does not end in November. We'll have an Advent reading that will begin where this list uh, ends. But I hope you'll pick up these two lists and read a chapter a day, sometimes less, sometimes more, just to get it all in there. But we've got two lists, beginning with Matthew in one list and Psalms in the other both reading schedules begin tomorrow, and so I hope you'll join us in reading God's Word together this year uh, in 2020. You won't, if, you, if you join with us now, we'll continue with this cycle. If you started with us last year, I think it's going to take us four years to get through all the Scripture at the pace we're going. D just some rough math there. Those readings are Monday through Friday, so if you get behind, you've got the whole weekend to catch up. So I hope you'll there, – there are those – both lists are on the table across from the Welcome Center or on either of the tables on your way out of these doors today. But I encourage you to pick up those lists and join us in reading beginning tomorrow. And with that, I, I encourage you to look at the bulletin for other announcements concerning upcoming events. Uh, but we're going to pray together now. We're going to pray 2 Peter 3.18 together as we conclude our first service of this new year. And that will be on the screen. Would you join with me in praying this together? But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Thank you. You're dismissed.